I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I am too. We're going to talk all the hits. We've got social. We've got encryption. We've got Bitcoin. And we've got net neutrality. This is like oh, great stuff. This is an hour of controversy. <laughs> <laughs> These are all perfectly uncontroversial topics. No one will disagree about. Hello, everyone. Everyone's saving their powder. I can tell. Mm -hmm. If you're if you're at your most interesting before the show starts, it's such right. a letdown for the mm -hmm. for the listeners. Yeah, and then by the end, you're tired of being interesting. You're like, yeah. <laughs> that old problem. <laughs> I just can't do it anymore. It's been an hour. It's a finite thing, being interesting. Yeah. Interesting is neither created nor destroyed. <laughs> There's only so much of it in the world, and you tap into it when you can. Yeah. Use too much of it. Uh, Got to be boring to recharge the interesting. It's a fallacy. A fixed amount of interesting. Out of pure curiosity, because that's what's on my mind at the moment, has anyone on here much experience with free NAS? Free NAS? Not in yeah. a while. Because that's what's waiting for me when I finish uh, I've recording. I've fooled around with it, but yeah, not not. It's pretty much. cool. The thing I never really, and it wasn't free NAS, is the fact that you, unless you use a laptop or some other machine that kind of has like built-in power management, I mean, if you don't mind just running a, like an old PC, and it kind of can be a power hog. Well, and I mean, you got to throw some CPU at that, right? I mean, if you're really depending on what you, you know, want to do, yeah. Like, if, you're, if you're really doing some stuff, if you just um, want like storage, it's it's not too much. But if you want to yeah. do all the other fancy stuff, well, I'm hoping a Plex server is, is where I'm hoping it'll go. I'm actually reviewing a Drobo to to see how well that does with it. So let me call. I want, yeah, I want to get a QNAS. To I, I need a rate. I just need. To I did a video on FreeNAS with Patrick Norton in 2005 for CNET. I it's stable. That explains why it's on version eleven. Yeah, it's been around. It's been around. That, it's it's super easy to set up. Like well, unless good. you're, it, it literally if you if you download the ISO and you boot it up, you just do all the yes no yes no and then the drives you okay. want. Well, well, right now I have a tower with ten empty drive bays and a USB stick with the ISO burnt onto it. So I'm hoping by the time <laughs> I go to bed, I'll have a file server. You should just protect that data. Protect it. Love it. Well, thankfully, it is protected because I had a perfectly working uh, file server running, I think it was CentOS or something, and it one of the disks with the OS on it fried. It's like, okay, fine. This is an excuse to rebuild it. But luckily, I have a second one, which has all the data on it, too. So, All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to roll. Sarah, are you prepared? I am. Okay, here we go. Three, two... Daily Tech News Show is powered by you. To find out more, head to dailytechnewsshow.com slash support. This is the Daily Tech News Show Roundtable for November, Thursday, November 30th, 2017, to be specific. From DTNS headquarters in Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lowe. <laughs> and I'm uh, Justin Robert Young from Oakland, California. And from quaint Hudson, Ohio, I'm Rich Straffolino. Oh, we went Hudson today. I like that. Uh, joining us as well is Bart Bouchotts, host and producer of Let's Talk Apple and Let's Talk Photography. And you are in deepest Ireland. Is that correct? I am. And judging, judging by, the, by my lighting here in darkest Ireland, too. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, it's a little later there than it is here. That's totally fine. Uh, we are going to talk today about encryption, about Bitcoin about social media and its future and about net neutrality because the advisors voted on it. This is our second round table show. Now, for those who might not be familiar, once a month, we expand the regular show into this full fledged round table discussion. And instead of the half hour of Sarah, me and a co-contributor covering the headlines that day, we do a full hour of meaty discussion uh, with Sarah, myself and our other contributors and guests and while all of our topics cover news of the day, we're going to start right now with a quick look at the top stories. 
Sources tell CNBC that Amazon plans to announce an Alexa Roger, your platform would include new marketplace specifically for Roger, your your audio from that web page is playing across Sarah and I can't hear her. Oh dear. Apologies. Apologies. But but by the way, The Last Jedi is in theaters. Uh in Yeah. <laughs> Not sponsored by The Last Jedi. Uh, let's just start over, Sarah. All right. Sources tell CNBC that Amazon plans to announce an Alexa for business platform along with partners who have created business-oriented skills for the platform. The new platform will include a new marketplace specifically for new business skills. Ericsson estimates 20% of the world will have 5G wireless connections by 2023. South Korea, Japan, China, the U.S. are likely to be the first countries to get 5G deployments. About half of that service is going to end up in Asia. South Korea plans to have some 5G service available for the Winter Olympics coming this February. And Verizon announced Wednesday it plans to have its first service available in Sacramento, California by the end of 2018. Ooh, just north. Microsoft has made its version of the Edge browser for Android and iOS. Among the features uh, are continuing on the PC, which lets you visit a site on the PC that you're looking at on your mobile Edge browser. The U.S. FDA approved the first medical accessory for the Apple Watch. A live core's Cardia band uses the watch's heart rate sensor and then a special watch band with an additional sensor to provide EKG readings. Uses a neural network to determine a person's normal heart rate, can detect things like abnormal heart rhythm, atrial fibrillation, and then sends that information to a doctor. The Cardia band is $199 and is free to use with the option to pay $99 a year for things like cloud storage of history, excuse me, and custom monthly reports. Stanford University also launched an Apple Heart Study app in the U.S. to detect irregularities using the watch's existing technology. Google launched an app called Datally for Android that tracks data usage by app on a device and can even turn the data on and off per app. Datally also scans for public Wi-Fi and lets users rate the Wi-Fi access point for other Datally users. In a test in the Philippines over the last several months, Google says users saved about 30% of mobile data. Google is experimenting with adding a feature that would give users the opportunity to get data awards for certain activities. The Wall Street Journal reported its sources say Wednesday that Alphabet is considering rolling Nest Labs into Google's hardware division. Reuters reported in June that Alphabet was considering selling Nest, which has been a problem child for them since their acquisition. And that's the top stories. Uh, Sarah, let's start off our discussions again. If you don't remember from last time, 15 minutes per discussion tops, and Roger will be playing us some nice soft music at the 15 minute mark to let us know when we get there. Yeah, Justin, let's start with your pick, which is the Snapchat redesign, which is really more than just a redesign, at least if you read the op-ed that Evan Spiegel posted in Axios yesterday. Yeah, uh, so Snapchat is kind of at a crossroads. Uh, by by uh, external indicators, they are slowing their growth. They're not receding, but it's not showing the explosive kind of trajectory that it had before. And so with the redesign, famously kind of hard to use the, the UI for Snapchat, now it's going to be at least a little bit more new user friendly, AKA old people friendly. Uh, Evan Spiegel took the next step at the uh, uh, the the, the uh, through Axios, and I think it was at the Business Insider conference, to say this is a fundamental difference in separating social from media. That uh, even drawing direct correlations to Facebook and saying, "Hey, look, Facebook, uh, the, the fake news problem that uh, is is now drawing attention from the federal government and might have affected the election of 2016, uh, is a systemic problem of us." mixing likes and shares with news. And what Snapchat wants to do is separate the social, AKA I wanna to talk to my friends and family and be connected with the media, uh, which you know, in, in this evolving era can maybe become too uh, uh, either social friendly and, and dilute the content or be out and out susceptible to fraud because that will get the red hot likes and shares. So my question is to everybody, is there a difference between social and media or is this just Evan Spiegel trying to give a very important redesign for his company a 
news hook and a purpose? I mean, without testing the new design, which doesn't start rolling out to people until Friday, it's hard for me to comment on how different it's going to be. And I mean, part of me is like, it's Snapchat. Like we're putting dog filters on ourselves. Like <laughs> let's all take it down a notch. Yeah. But I do respect the fact that there's more to it. At least, you know, the company's rhetoric kind of reminds me a little bit of what Path said back in the day, where it was like, you know, there's something weird about, you know, th that arena sense of being in yeah. social media, amassing followers, talking to everybody, and it changes our behavior. So I, I feel like they've, you know, for lack of better words, have their heart in the right place. I just, I don't, I don't know if I see Snapchat as like some intimate friend thing thing it's more of like a silly thing yeah i know it can be used a lot of different ways but i think most people don't really use it as like the uh you know mode of communication with their loved ones and that's kind of the spin that i'm getting from them well, well the teens do teens use it like the, if the to to check in with all their friends and make sure their friends have checked in with them yeah that's, that's true that's true i just um i think I think, you know, Evan Spiegel is making great points when he's saying, you know, social media uh, changes our behavior and that's sometimes dangerous, you know, and, and points to a lot of uh, examples of that. I just don't know how separating things with a swipe changes Snapchat all that much. Is, isn't this kind of a, a weird um, uh, distinction to be made from a camera company after all? Right. That's isn't what Evan Spiegel what says. Yeah, um, you know, to me, this this seems kind of uh, a very cynical move to me. I mean, obviously, they need to do something to disrupt. Uh, I'm going to borrow a Justin Robert Young phrase: uh, change their narrative uh, within the popular landscape. Messaging super hot. Um, you know, social networks kind of the competing in the social network space means you're obviously going to be always constantly compared to Facebook. And while there are giant, huge uh, incumbents in the messaging space as well, uh, I think that seems a less insurmountable uh, um, uh, uh, you know, vertical to kind of combat. Uh, they already have some success there. I mean, my problem is I feel like that does really well to play to their, their current audience, the, the younger audience, the people that um, are already comfortable using uh, you know, a mass messaging app that, that, that check in with their friends, like you were saying, maybe put some silly filters on there. I don't see how this does anything though to stem the loss of, uh, or the slowing of growth. Um, and it, and it certainly, it, it, it basically, it almost seems to me like a concession to, uh, the, the tide of Instagram stories, like that's your social network. And, you know, it seems like everyone's really comfortable making that, you know, using that as a social network. Well, let me, let me broaden it out beyond Snapchat a little bit. Is there a difference between social and media as we are all kind of evolving on these platforms? Will we see these things diverge again? Because there's no reason why they they have to necessarily be in the same place. Uh, it just was the the way that we all connected initially. Like uh, we we've seen that the trend has been don't make a new. A live trivia thing on Facebook, make a new live trivia thing as its own app that is separate in its own ecosystem. Are we going to see more of that driven by the idea that, yeah, you want to know what? Just because my uncle and his three friends like it doesn't mean that it needs to be what would theoretically be the top story in the newspaper of my life. I think he may have hit upon a natural division in social media that is only becoming apparent now that social media is so pervasive. In the early days of Twitter, you just talked to whoever was there and it was mostly people you knew. Uh, and then as Twitter got bigger and bigger and bigger, it became brands, it became randos, it became eggs, it became all kinds of things. And I have often thought, I wish there was a better way besides lists and blocking and stuff to have a Twitter for just like 2007 era Twitter, where I talked to the people I really want to talk to. And then there was a broadcast Twitter where I could say, hey, this one's open for the rest of the world to have a conversation. So I- OG I Twitter was, only, noobs go home. It was, <laughs> I, I think it was, no, it's, it's more like the way I use Facebook uh, has been to say, I'm only really friends with people I know. And sometimes I'm even, I even wish I was only friends with like close relatives and friends. Uh, because there's occasionally times I'd like to talk about something and I'm like, yeah, but I don't want to talk to everybody. 
about that. And there really isn't a space that's nicely defined for you to do that. Yeah, and I guess this comes down to of needing to see what uh, what exactly the redesign is going to do to see if if Snapchat can you know kind of meet that need. I mean, obviously the 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 other big barrier then is like if I tell my mom to sign up for Snapchat, I mean there are more impossible things I could ask her to do, but not many. <laughs> um, so like again, to me it's it's about you know the the, the question of whether you can separate social and media. Um, I, it's it's tough for me to argue against convergence after a certain point. And I, I just don't think Snapchat is, is certainly not the, I, I don't think they're positioned to be the company to do that. Snapchat also, I mean, the way that, you know, they talk about the service is as if this is a very intimate experience. I mean, when I send a snap, anybody who's following me can see it because I kind of use it like Twitter. Yeah. So, you know, if I was sending, you know, Tom or Justin or any of you, you know, like very curated things that weren't for everybody, that would be one thing. But I just don't think a lot of people use it that way. Well, old people don't. Young people do. Like that, <laughs> that's that that's the thing. And I'm I'm old. I mean, like, like when I say old, I mean over 16. Like uh, <laughs> because uh, you it, are not kid. Tell me another one. I know, I know, I know. I, these luscious locks. Uh, certainly, my, my my gray streaks in my hair is the, all the rage for homecoming. Uh, but uh, but listen, it, it, it is the reason why I think they've seen their growth slow. Because for me, if we're going to get back to Snapchat as a specific platform, they missed the moment for them to pivot from we are the fun, edgy, dangerous app that might be for sexting, but also is for messaging, but also is where all the cool celebrities are, uh, to, hey, no, we're a part of your life that you want to keep on your phone even after you stop talking to your high school friends. And and that is what I think they're trying to do now is grow up in a hurry. They're taking out those those big spacers out of their ears and, and uh, you know, trying to buy long sleeve shirts to cover up the tattoos because it's time to go apply for jobs. This, you know, to me, Evan Spiegel writing an op-ed in a place like Axios, which is read by a certain you know class of people, it is dad media. Uh, uh, that is him saying, "Hey, look, Snapchat is is here for the old people, and we're even going to talk about the 2016 election." Kids don't want to talk about that, but their parents sure as hell do. <sighs> that hurts because I think of Axios as kind of a young up and coming. <laughs> 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 Bart, brow, I think is what Justin was saying. Yeah, yeah. no, and that, that's a point well taken. Uh, Bart, I'm curious what your take is on all this. Do you even dabble in any of this? Well, I see I'm I'm a bit of a curmudgeon, I guess. I must be really old because I don't do Facebook and I don't do Snapchat and I don't do WhatsApp. So I feel slightly lost in this conversation. But I will say one thing strikes me. It's been a long time now on sort of the history of the internet where companies have been striving to intentionally mix the stuff you want with other stuff. And this is the first time I've seen a company intentionally unmix those two things. Swipe left for one, swipe right for the other. And I wish more companies would do that. I would like Twitter to remove all the cruft from my feed that I didn't ask to be put there. I would like Google to take their ads and take them out of my search results and put them separately. So as a concept, I don't think it's a bad idea. Whether it'll work or not, whether people will like it, I haven't the faintest idea because I don't use these services. But I just I do like the concept of it being clearer what's what I, I think that has to be a good thing surely yeah i hadn't even thought about the fact that that it is a change it is a watershed moment uh for social media and the, and the internet in general to say you know what you need actually is more separation what you need is is less integration less of putting everything into everything i think that's that might itself be an important growing up moment for the internet right there well you know in uh evan uh Mr. Spiegel, um, he did say, listen, this is what we're going to do. We're going to act more like Netflix. You know, when Netflix uh, suggests a new movie or TV show for you, it's because of your past history. It's not because of what your friends like, because it's about you. And I mean, everybody uses Netflix as an example of something that works, but I get that. I get why that is healthier, um, at least part of the time, if you're going to be on all these apps anyway. My my question is, where does this take them in terms of monetization, right? Because are they, I mean, are they still going to be serving ads in between snaps if you're just using the oh, yeah. the, the yes. person? So then, I mean, so then to me, the the differentiation between media and you know ads are just another form of media. Um, so 
you, yeah, you're you're getting away from maybe you, then you're just taking away from me the choice of media. You're still serving me ads that I don't have control over. Um, and, and to me, like I, I don't know. Then then it just seems like we're you know it's just a, a simple UI change. Doesn't seem as big of a deal to me. Well, um, and, you know, and, obviously, and, if it leads to growth, it's something, but. Well, and they also choose the media that's on there, right? I think any media can have a, a, an account, but they choose what goes into the special paddock of approved uh, uh, media sources that you're going to swipe for. So unless you're following the media, uh, you know, that, I guess that would be the other question, is are they now going to ban you from following brands as their own Snapchat accounts? You know, is, is uh, I don't know. It, the, the Snapchat has always been an interesting property because they have been very antiviral in an age when virality is all that matters when you know we we uh, do a backflip cuz a kid gets a bunch of chicken nugget retweets or uh, again more 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 sinisterly we have hoaxes grow immediately when the natural confusion of a disaster becomes something that algorithmically is at the top of your google page or facebook page uh, snapchat has kind of always been hey look we we want to not let you easily be able to share stuff because we want you to post the stuff there. And again, this is from their more you know, racy origins. The initial idea was I want to post drunk videos and I don't want my perspective. <laughs> that go <employed."> away. Yeah. <laughs> that don't live on forever on the internet and like keep me from getting a job later. Exactly. I mean, that was in their initial business model, right? So uh, uh, this is something that they now have to figure out. All right. Well, there was obviously something there and yet people aren't necessarily finding much of a use for it when they aren't getting drunk with their friends that they want to share videos with as much. Uh, or tastes are changing a little bit. How do we adjust to it? And is antivirality an element of it? And I, I think that it could be. Ultimately, I think Sarah nailed it initially that like whether or not these are good ideas, the idea that Snapchat is the guardian <laughs> to, to emblazon this bad right. is a little silly. Snapchat's gonna save humanity, get us all back to like acting like you know we all did before social media ruined everything. I mean, it's 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 kind of silly. Oh. And that's our cue to move on to our next discussion. Uh, Bart Bouchatz, you have this one. Uh, I asked you particularly uh, when we did our episode last week about encryption. Uh, to listen in, because I know you work with this in your day job uh, quite a lot, and let me know what you thought we did right in our discussion, uh, and, and what are some interesting points that we may have missed, because it's a vast topic, and in 30 minutes, you, you don't have uh, enough time to cover everything. Uh, it sounded like you thought we did a pretty decent job with yeah. what we did, but you pointed out some really interesting parts of encryption that we didn't cover, starting with hardware encryption. Yeah, so I mean, you you laid out really well why the concept of a, a global backdoor is just fundamentally flawed and a terrible idea. Um, I, I think you guys covered that superbly. Uh, but the problem is there's niches where the government can make reasonable cases that are technically feasible. All of the non-technical arguments still stand, but the technical arguments are much harder. So uh, two examples came to mind as I was, we were having our conversation, and the first of those was the hardware encryption on your iPhone. So at the point your iPhone, and I'm assuming it's the same with other platforms, but let's, I just know the iPhone, so let's stick there. At the point that's made in the factory, there is a private key, there is a key pair, a public private key pair generated at the point of manufacture, and it is inside the secure enclave on your phone, and it can never come out. And that is mixed into all of the security on your iPhone. That is ultimately what is protecting everything on your iPhone. Now, there is no reason in theory that Apple couldn't be ordered by a court to keep a copy. So one copy gets burned into your iPhone forever, and Apple keep a copy, and they just keep it on file, match to the serial number. And when a judge says, dear Apple, I order you to hand over the private key for serial number A4234, that Apple have to hand it over to the relevant law enforcement. That is technically entirely feasible. It's not a backdoor for anyone, because Apple still have the keys. The only danger would be that if someone were to hack Apple, and get the database of all keys, well, oh dear God, because there's no way to put a fresh key into these iPhones, right? So it's so you're saying it's not a it doesn't suffer the live software based attacks that we talked about last week. Yeah. And and in fact, even though law enforcement prefers that these things be available quickly, having it at all would be quicker than not having it. And they might agree right. to it having it stored offline, which 
would be more secure than having it stored online. It still, yeah. to me though, suffers the same vulnerability oh, yeah. of if you lose that key, it's lost. Uh, it, yes. It's not necessarily the same backdoor where it's a universal key for everything though. I see what you're saying. Yeah, so it's not the same. And it, it, it sounds much more reasonable and you can make a much better technical argument for it. But at the end of the day, you're still left with the really, the really gaping problem. What works for a democratic government works for a totalitarian government. Sure. And no matter what side of the political spectrum you're on, you, you say a government you like and I'll say one you detest. You know, and, if they, and if Apple does it for one, they're going to end up having to do it for the other. Or leave the country. Mm -hmm. no, or not sell a single device or service in that country ever again. And Apple can't go around not selling to half the planet. They're a corporation. That's literally, they have a fiduciary duty not to do that. Yeah. And well, and, and their sales in Europe, the US and China pretty much float the company. I mean, they, they do sell iPhones in other parts of the world and they're working really hard to bring up sales in India next. But, but those three markets are the markets they have to be in. Yeah, I mean, look, they removed Skype from the App Store, not because they wanted to or not because they think that's a good idea, because if they didn't, they'd be out of China. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in China, they removed it from the App Store. Don't yeah. worry. if well, Oh, yeah, sorry. If, or, or don't celebrate if, <laughs> yeah. either way, no matter mm, what. Yeah, 50-50 on that one. So, okay. So I, I think there, that's a theoretical issue that we're probably not going to see a company like Apple do. And I haven't heard anyone pressuring for that particular solution yet. It's been this broader backdoor that we talked about last time. What's the other example, the other niche example? Well, the other niche example is one that's probably more realistic is, is instant messaging. Um, so again, I'm going to use iMessage as the example because Apple give white papers on how their encryption works, whereas other companies don't give out the white papers. So Apple aren't giving out the source code, but they are giving out the design. So that lets us know a lot more of what's going on. So. Let's say I'm messaging you an iMessage and you have five Apple devices because, well, that's just, you know, we're nerds, we do that. Sure. I would actually be encrypting that message five times, once for each of your devices, because I would have been given the public key that matches the private key that's stuck in your device and never comes out. But we're not managing those keys ourselves. If you're using Signal, you are managing the keys yourself. And then you know for sure what's being encrypted and how it's all going. But when you use iMessage, it's all public private key crypto, but the keys are being managed on your behalf by Apple. So they can just add an extra key. And so if the government have a private key, they just add that into your public key set. And then everybody messages you is also messaging the government. So that's like a wiretap. Now it can't go back in time, but it, it is it is entirely feasible to give Apple an order to say right now, today, you add this extra key to Bart. And we have right. the matching private key. Apple wouldn't even have the matching private key. They'd just be told, here, add this public key. And again, not a backdoor because it's not, not a, backdoor. it's not implemented for everyone. It's implemented on an individual user basis. Yeah, exactly. So basically, there is a key chain that Apple manage on my behalf that lists for everyone who wants to message me all of my public keys. And Apple would simply lie, for want of a better word, and inject an extra key. And then Which we have our conversations and the other person's listening in. I'm almost 98% certain I'm missing something, but that almost sounds reasonable if it's got safeguards on it, like court warrants and, and all of that, because like you say, right. it does sound like wiretapping. It does. It sounds much more reasonable than the concept of let's have an escrow backdoor and all encryption ever. I mean, th this is a way more reasonable thing and it is implementable, but of course it does mean that Apple will have to admit that they manage the keys because Apple likes to say, oh no, we can't possibly get in the middle because it's end-to-end -end encrypted. Asterix, we control the keys. Right. Now, when you when they say they control the keys, that doesn't mean that they get at the keys. That means that they're no. kept on their servers. Oh, not even and, necessarily that, because they never get our private keys, but they're managing the distribution of our public keys. Gotcha. And so and they so, can distribute a key that's not our public key as if it was our public almost key. Almost like a man in the middle attack is what you're suggesting. Kind of, yeah. So they sort of stick an extra key into the, into the key chain that they hand off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean... What do you what do you think of all of this? Uh, what what even with these these sort of extra exceptions here, mm. do you think there is a way that governments could get access to encrypted material that doesn't break encryption for everybody else? Well, generally speaking, like a device is not an island. So looking at it from we must break the encryption on the device is looking at it completely backwards because you're going to be interacting with things and places and companies and services. And you should look at it from that side, not from not, not trying to break the encryption, particularly not the encryption while the thing is in flight. That that's particularly nefarious. It's you know, you your cell phone company knows so much about you. It's 
this whole going dark thing is just complete nonsense because what's happening is things are reverting back to how they were only a decade or two ago. I mean, it's it, it's not going dark. It's just there was a brief flash of light and the flash is fading. That's it. It's you know, it's it's looking at it wrong and pretending that somehow it's normal to be able to see everything. That's not that's not normal. That has never yeah, been normal. It's completely new. Bad encryption or no encryption. It was a lot easier to tell what people were saying to each other because they were saying it to each other over this big internet rather than privately in the back alley where you had to have a person spying on them to know what they said. Yeah, and so we had a brief blip where everything was in public on the internet and then we realized that was a terrible idea and now we're going back to normality and to pretend that going back to normality is some sort of calamity, catastrophe that law enforcement could never survive is, is nuts. Rich, what do you think about this from, because uh, you cover things from the enterprise side and, and enterprise has their own issues with this because trade secrets and, and security is hard enough <laughs> as it is in the enterprise. Uh, well, what, it's, what do you, what, it's really yeah. interesting, actually, because uh, talking about, you know, the encrypted messaging systems and, and that being very similar to a wiretap, there are whole companies. Uh, the, the, the big term that's uh, popular now um, is to go along with security when you're not quite a security company, but you're a networking company that wants to get into security or something like that. The term is visibility. That's a huge term uh, right now and, and a lot of companies getting into that. And basically what a lot of companies uh, do are essentially uh, not be government mandated or not be, you know, the, the Apple mandated, you know, Apple lying about uh, monitoring the public or the public keys, excuse me. Um, they are basically doing authorized man in the middle attacks to uh, monitor traffic. Uh, there are a number of, like I said, there are a number of companies uh, that, uh, that that is their business model. You will see their slide decks and the top of the slide deck says, you know, uh, man in the middle, here's how we do it. And the, and the reason is on a, on a, you know, on an enterprise level, obviously, uh, encryption is kind of problematic when you wanna control everything that's on your, pro you know, the network that's coming into your business. Um, the increase to, uh, you know, of HTTPS traffic and general encryption uh, does cause some problem. Uh, it's actually quite remarkable about only 20% of malware is actually currently encrypted and that's still causing huge amounts of problems. And that's why these companies are cropping up is because that number is, uh, is obviously going to be increasing uh, over time. Um, but uh, yeah, the, you know, on, a, uh, on an enterprise level, this is, this is a business model for a lot of companies. Being the man in the middle who attacks things for good, yeah. But yeah. Will, uh, you're not in the middle, though. You're on the edge. Right? Everything. It, it's it's not quite a man in the middle. It's it's a man at the edge of your enterprise. It's a it's a security guard at your own front door. I mean, it's not quite a man. Well, in but the middle. there but there there are breaking encryption. I mean, they're they're spoofing certificates, uh, looking at what your Dropbox traffic is. And again, it's because you know. I, but you also tacitly make that agreement when that you know when you're on that enterprise network and you're looking you know at your Dropbox folder or whatnot. You know there there is a there is a business argument that says, you know, at a certain point you check your privacy at the door or, or don't use their network and use your phone on LTE or whatever. But I wouldn't even, breaking is actually the wrong word. It's terminating the encryption and re-encrypting. And they can only do so because you're on their network. Therefore, you've accepted their certificates because you're part of their Active Directory domain or whatever, and they've pushed those certificates down to your machine. So you're you're you're, you're terminating the encryption at the border. You're examining the traffic and then re-encrypting for the last mile back to the desktop. I mean, breaking isn't quite the right word. I mean, it's, well, they're not it's hacking. breaking from the perspective of anyone who's not part of the company. Well, if they're not part of the company, then they can't work because they won't have the certificate. They won't be able to validly right. re-sign. No, I know. So it'll just say insecure connection and you'll go, ooh, best walk yeah. away from here. I, it's, it, the, it's hard to wrap your head around it because the idea that a company would ever let someone under their network without a certificate these days is ridiculous, but that's that's yeah. the only reason that it, that it breaks, quote unquote, yeah. Let's take the temperature of the room here, Justin. Uh, listening to all this, do you, do you feel safer, less safe, or just as confused as ever? Uh, I, would, I would make the, uh, the argument that uh, there's a reason why a lot of these uh, security breaches happen on all levels, because uh, uh, it's obviously not a very simple uh, process, uh, nor do we really understand how all the pieces move. Uh, uh, you know, to, to talk about the iMessage thing that, you know, sure, things are end-to-end -end encrypted, but, you know, in in, in the uh, words of Rowdy Rowdy Piper, was, as soon as you know the answers, they can change the questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and, and that's literally what Bart was just uh, describing, was Apple being able to change the question about which key uh, decrypts the thing. I mean, it's it's the Rowdy Rowdy Piper attack of the United States. 
But do bear in mind, though, that anyone who wants the encryption, if you use Signal, then you take on ownership for the key management, and then you have mathematically sound encryption. Yeah. And you're in control of the keys. So the technology is there. It's just human beings, ordinary users don't want to manage keys. Like We just want simplicity. So we're prepared to sacrifice a bit of security. I just trust Apple to manage the keys for us. Yeah. Or Facebook or whoever. And, and honestly, for a lot of things, you know, people, I, I know some some security purists get get upset at this notion, but for a lot of things, that's fine. I don't, yeah. I did not mind that Google's Allo did not really have end to end encryption uh, as long as I knew that about it. I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll still have conversations on Allo. I mean, I don't because nobody uses it, but that's not the problem that I'm describing here. I would still have conversations on Allo. Uh, I just would know, like, okay, these conversations are not 100% secure. They're partially secure. So I know if I'm really worried about something, this is not what I'm going to use. I'm going to use Signal for that. Uh, I don't think every single thing needs to be encrypted all the way, uh, but I think we have erred so far in the other direction for so long that you kind of it, it's kind of dangerous to to express that notion because it gives people an excuse to continue with the sloppy encryption practices that have prevailed up till now. Yeah, it's probably better to encrypt by default. Just you know, yeah. don't think about it. I'm I'm bringing up a new web service or whatever. Just encrypt it. Well, and Allo encrypts, it just doesn't encrypt yeah. all the way to the end. Uh, exactly, and, and that, that's that's fine. It's good enough for that. And as, and again, as long as I know that, and I can make that yeah. decision when I use this. Sarah, do you, do you stay up at night worrying about encryption or? Um, not all that often. I, you know, I think when I listen to this conversation, it's like, you know, if you take Apple as an example, because we've been talking about Apple a lot. I mean, as a company that's for profit, and you mentioned India and the fact that Apple wants to grow in India, and they've had to make some concessions with the Indian government, which wants some access to uh, to stuff that Apple initially pushed back on, and then you know probably thought about it again. It's you know it's complicated because it's like you're trying to build your business in regional markets that have different ways of thinking. So yes, I mean, on, at face value, everything should be encrypted and it should work, but that's not really the way the world works. Well, and that goes back to Bart's uh, point about we need to make sure that precedents we set in any country, US, UK, China, anywhere, uh, aren't the kind of precedents that require us or the companies that are, that are implementing them to have to do them in places that would be less comfortable for them to do so. And with that, Sarah, we move on to our next topic. We do. I'm excited about this one because it's something that uh, I have a very loose understanding of, and that is background browser-based crypto mining. It's a real thing. Yeah. Did you know about yeah, it? Yeah. Tell us what is this. It, it is really, it is really fascinating. So you may have heard uh, in the news uh, the past couple of months, uh, particularly about a company called or organization. I don't know uh, how they're organized. Uh, called CoinHive, and basically what they do is offer a JavaScript-based uh, uh, crypto miner. They mine Monero currency uh, while you're on a web page. Uh, this can be done a number of ways. They can have a little uh, counter. You click a play button, and it starts, uh, you know, doing the the complicated maths. You can set the number of threads, and you can see, you know, exactly uh, how many hashes you're getting per second or whatnot. Um, but where uh, it's made the news and has kind of made a bad name. For CoinHive, and this, uh, you know, uh, may have just been some naivete on their part, or perhaps some nefariousness. We're not sure. Is that uh, you know companies? Um, we, I think it was Showtime that had it on their website for a while. Uh, a couple of others have come through, and people were installing the JavaScript miner in the background, and you could set that up so that you wouldn't know that you were mining that. All of a sudden, your CPU's uh, 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 you know uh, percentage spikes up a little bit, and uh, you're mining crypto, and you don't even know it. Now that's what's made the news. And you know, makes people oh, you know, um, uh, malware um, defenders have started uh, blacklisting uh, their JavaScript miner. So you you know, if you have uh, malware bytes installed, you're you're not going to be able to you know use CoinHive uh, or at least have it used uh, in the background on any web pages you visit, even if you want to. Um, obviously, you can whitelist it if you really you know want to, but most people aren't that involved with it. Um, but my question is, I like to me fundamentally, it's a very interesting question of monetization, right? Um, we pay for content in a variety of ways. Uh, if you know content's behind a paywall, you know maybe you just directly exchange currency. Maybe you exchange your privacy uh, with something uh, you know like uh, uh, content on Facebook. Um, to you know to a large degree, that's how you're paying 
for a lot of social networking. Maybe you're paying for it with your attention through advertising. Maybe you're uh, paying for it through, you know, kind of crowd equity or goodwill, something like Patreon, although that does, uh, you know, have direct uh, currency exchange. But I, you know, I don't think it's fundamentally a bad idea to say, hey, uh, a web page maybe takes up what twenty percent of my CPU at any given moment, unless there's ninety autoplay ads going in the background. Uh, why not use a little bit of that? Kick, you know, use that as a monetization strategy. And I was, I was kind of curious uh, what people's thoughts were if it's handled with the right degree of transparency. So if I understand this correctly, I could be mining, uh, you know, towards a Bitcoin that I don't get at the end of it. I'm just helping mine it. Yeah, you're. So yeah, the the company would. That doesn't sound that good to me. They they would set up their wallet. Uh, on their web page. So like say, the, the example, actually, uh, CoinHive has a number of examples of how to monetize this. So the, the idea would be, you know, if you're a video creator and you have videos set up on your website and people go there and they park there for 20 minutes at a time to watch your videos or something like that, um, you know, instead of running a, a lower third ad, running sidebar ads, having autoplay video going on, they'd be mining Bitcoin as, or not Bitcoin, I'm, excuse me. Bitcoin doesn't work in this scheme because your CPU is far too terrible at it. Um, for it to make any kind of economic sense. They use a, a, a cryptocurrency called Monero, which is, it's an open source currency. And at this point, uh, C consumer CPUs can still get pretty decent hashes on it. Uh, and that's why they're using it. Um, that that raises a whole nother issue. But, um, you know, the, the idea would be, you know, any, t any place you're parked reading or watching content for a little while, instead of being served an ad, which is also going to impact your performance on your machine, it's gonna take more memory, it's gonna take more CPU, why not directly, you know, provide a more direct uh, monetization form in the form of mining cryptocurrency? Just seems like something that like, almost like Amazon referral codes, right? If you disclose it, I might not have a problem with it. I would have a problem if I didn't know it was happening. Yeah, and I think that's why they've gotten a lot of uh, bad press to date. Um, I, you know, I, I do think there are a number of issues that uh, this may run into. Um, obviously, again, like, you know, CoinHive has kind of, I, I think is uh, maybe a, a dead concern at this point, only because they just have such a bad reputation. They're blacklisted on a number of, uh, you know, through a number of different, uh, it categorizes malware basically. And, uh, but, but the other question is more technical, like, you know, as you continue to mine the Monero blockchain, it's going to get more difficult and CPUs aren't getting, you know, aren't getting dramatically uh, better in terms of performance uh, year to year. So the, the monetization itself, will slow. So unless you get more and more people choosing to do that, um, it's going to get less and less effective. And then that has to become more complex. And it's, you know, an argument whether that's worth it. Um, and, you know, and then there's also it's, is it desirable for users? And so, you know, that, that was kind of my question to the panel is, would, you know, is this fundamentally objectionable, uh, a good idea, or, you know, just kind of fuzzy in the middle? Well, I think what's what's interesting about this, is the way the ever-changing way in which we understand that creators can get paid uh we are in a market where i think uh, uh, the la weekly i believe yesterday uh, yep. decided to shutter uh, uh we are in a, a rapidly shifting media environment once untouchable uh, uh you know conglomerates are now showing gigantic signs of, of, of cracking i mean hell tom uh you've been doing court killers for how long uh four years yeah, four years and then frame rate before that. Uh, uh, you guys are hashtag old enough to remember when Disney was releasing earnings reports that ESPN was the most profitable part of their company. And now it is a gigantic albatross in a very short period of time. Uh, so as we look at all that and we think about, okay, well, advertising has been, you know, uh, uh, eroding. Display advertising has been eroding since AdWords. It's just shifting, shifting. It's just a different way of doing it. Uh, I, 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 you know, they go for less. People have, there's a reason why people have pivoted to video because video ads get a higher uh, a CPM. The idea of looking at a thing and clicking on it is less desirable or looking at it just on a television screen or in a magazine is far less desirable than it used to be. My point is, with pay, when Patreon came around, there's a reason why it was sticky. Now that we're looking, now that cryptocurrency has become more and more of a, you know, the, the, the stories we read about, uh, uh, you know, uh, Bitcoin now are in the financial pages, not in the tech pages, not in the uh, curiosity. Well, look at what these uh, this, this scheme is. I wonder when this Ponzi scheme is going to fall apart. Uh, it's a serious concern. So this idea, obviously, CoinHive has made some missteps and maybe they're the first one through the door that gets shot. But 
look at forms like let's say for example long form audio while you know we don't have uh, maybe pc processing isn't isn't what it was certainly mobile phone processing is considered as as advanced uh, uh, as as it's gone forward if cryptocurrency is something that continues to be a way that people uh that is taken more and more seriously then the idea that you could mine a blockchain on a phone and and tom at the beginning of this podcast you could say you are contributing to this show literally by listening to it and doing nothing else <laughs> help That's us reach one bitcoin listen what? to the show again <laughs> it's like look we already understand that the most valuable commodity in this new media environment is attention and what if you could monetize it directly based on the processor that you are using to pay attention to media that to me is an extraordinarily interesting idea well and and justin i think this it, the key to this is what you were saying with patreon because there were schemes to crowdfund things for as long as the internet has existed right i mean everyone you know hey click on the donate to my paypal page the the beauty of patreon and its competitors out there is that it one, it, it formalizes it, it makes it one place to go, you integrate all the rewards uh, into the same platform, you turn it into a weird social network at the same time. That's what like this kind of crypto mining as monetization needs. And I, I think there is actually a model out there that does, a, a, like, that could, that could uh, you know, serve as, as, a, as a good framework for it. Uh, and that was the Brave browser, which is already, it's not doing the mining, but what it's doing is allowing you to, you know, buy some crypto tokens and contribute those to creators that you like based on the attention that you, you know, by, by the amount of time that you're spending on their sites and that kind of stuff. And so if, you know, again, if you had a browser that could maybe have even deeper hooks into your system and you could very fine tune control, hey, never take more than 20% of my idle CPU usage, never take more than 10% of my memory or something like that. Or, you know, hey, I'm not using my GPU maybe use 10% of that and really, you know, turbocharge it, integrate that into, you know, have leaderboards, uh, be able to, uh, you know, you know, kind of publicly brag, hey, look, I contributed, you know, uh, 0 0.001 Bitcoins to Daily Tech News Show. Um, I, I think that could be a way forward. But yeah, right now, it's just a messy piece of code that people don't know is being exploited on their machine. And that's what it is exploitation yeah. at this point well and i i credit you with with seeing beyond coin hives darker side to the idea behind them that may end up getting traction potentially which is you know you shouldn't do this on the sly without telling people that's a recipe for disaster and that's what coin hives dealing with right now but let's say washington post or patreon or you know uh the weekly standard uh all team up all three of them uh to say hey we're gonna we're gonna standardize it on this blockchain platform and we're gonna give you the opportunity when you show up at our sites to say either i would like to see ads or i would like to subscribe or i would like to have a crypto coin mind while i'm while i'm reading this article uh and then it's no more nagging of like hey please turn off your ad blocker it's no more paywall of like well if you don't pay us you don't get the article it's it's a choice like you'll get the article anyway how do you want it to do that i think that would be amazing because what the potential of this is is i think what justin was saying turning your attention into the transaction Everything else we're talking about, subscriptions, advertising, et cetera, that's all a middleman. Even the Brave browser is a middleman to say, we'll turn your attention into this other thing, which then turns it into money. And having it actually mined just by looking or playing, in Justin's example, uh, is very attractive. But you hit upon the problem, Rich, which is the more valuable and the more used a crypto coin gets, the harder it is to mine. And so the value of the attention gets smaller and smaller over time, and that that's a problem. Yeah, the the technical limitations, uh, you know, would be a concern. Then that becomes: Are you swapping from cryptocurrency to cryptocurrency? That seems really sloppy. And and as an organization, you know, if you know, maybe if it's your personal blog, and you know, once a year you end up with uh, you know a, a hundredth of a Bitcoin or a you know a Monero, whatever the Monero coin is, XMR I think is the abbreviation. You know, if you end up with a little Monero at the end of the year, hey, that's great. All right, that's a bonus. Maybe I can you know pay to get my domain name back. 
Uh, but if you know you're The Verge or your you know YouTube or something like that, you can't you know one cryptocurrency is is relative is so volatile right now that obviously you you couldn't depend on it if you're a major publisher. But two, then if you're changing currencies, that leads into like a whole morass too. So, I, you know, good idea. I'm not sure if the you know practically I mean, that's why you would almost need deeper hardware hooks than a simple JavaScript miner at that point. Uh, by, by the way, a Monero coin currently trades for $175.25. And that's up like $70, I think. Uh, I think it was like 90 uh, just a few months ago. Uh, indeed, or I could be wrong. I mean, what strikes me is this is still kind of a middleman, right? I mean, if you really wanted to monetize your viewers, you could imagine setting up something like... Um, I don't know, highly distributed cloud systems where like like Amazon EC2, you sell people's CPU and then you literally you could you your machine could be doing anyone's workload for anything. I mean, yeah, that could, could be could actually be, and that wouldn't devalue over time. Folding proteins or SETI at yeah. home or or just dealing with people's storage. That's that's where mesh becomes really interesting, right? Yeah. Yeah. So well, oh, sorry. I was gonna say, you know, it doesn't have to be crypto mining with this terrible variation over time and uns uncertainty cpus are valuable so if you're going to start taking people's cpu a be honest about it and b well you know just take their cpu for something else also, yeah I, I love choice you know if it's like hey do you want an autoplay ad no what about some background crypto mining maybe that no. you know like you know who knows it's a personal choice but i think like there is something to the idea of saying listen you're going to pay some way, you know, for this content that you're consuming of ours, but we want you to be happy as possible. So here are your choices. You're going to be the product one way or the other. Give us <laughs> your time and your sweet CPU. Well, Bart, I think you solved it though. It's, it's somebody needs to come up with a system that says, we, if you'll, if you'll choose, you can have ads, you can subscribe, or you can donate your PC cycles. Yeah. We'll take care of what they're doing on our end. Don't you worry about that. It could be crypto mining. It could be web services. Who knows? But and it would have to have auditing and make sure that it's secure and it's not invading your machine with with stuff. But that's no different than than things like folding at home. Yeah, and JavaScript yeah. is inherently containerized anyway. So arguably, the web is a pretty darn good platform for that because you're constantly running code handed to you by other people in such a way that it can't dick around on your own machine. I would, I, I in theory, I think there's there are a lot of things that we are we are looking at as a technical problem uh, that. You know, just have one random server in Cambodia streaming things that are really, really bad, and all of a sudden that will affect you. Well, folks, uh, we're going to finish up with a with a lighthearted topic, uh, one that I don't think gets anyone upset. Even lighter, uh, <laughs> not <laughs> controversial. Yeah, uh, net neutrality and the ISP last mile problem uh, was one of the topics suggested in our open thread for people at the advisor level on our Patreon at the beginning of the month. And then we took suggestions from that open thread, put them in a poll for our advisors at the end of the month, and net neutrality was the one they chose. One of the things that I was asked to talk about, particularly in our Slack, uh, was Comcast uh, changing their net neutrality pledge on the day that the FCC first proposed these new open internet guidelines, which by the way, aren't in place yet. They are voted upon December 14th. Even after they get voted upon, they don't go into a place uh, right away. They have to get published in the congressional record and all of that. Uh, but, but on April 26th, I think, if I have that right, Comcast changed what they said. And people were like, what do you think of this? And it's a big deal. You see a lot of people getting very upset about this. John Brodkin has done yeoman's work highlighting the changes in the statements. I'm not going to go through all the statements because there's some that have to do with, with a, uh, a low-income support uh, system that just went away. Uh, that's kind of its own topic, but particularly regarding blocking, throttling, and paid prioritization. Before April, Comcast said Comcast won't block access to lawful content. Comcast won't throttle back the speed at which content comes at you. And Comcast doesn't prioritize internet traffic or create paid fast lanes. That's the one that people are focusing on because the new statement simply says, we do not block, slow down, or discriminate against lawful content. Now, Comcast is trying to argue, 
we was just better editing. We just made this wordy three-part statement into one sentence. We don't block is the same as Comcast won't block access to lawful content. We don't slow down. Comcast won't throttle back the speed. It's the same thing. We don't discriminate. Comcast doesn't prioritize internet traffic or create paid fast lanes. Uh, but if it doesn't mean something different, why change it? Well, there's because there, it there. sounded awful the way they said it before. It sounds great there. Yeah, it well, it is it is a tighter way of writing it, certainly. But also we don't discriminate is different than we don't prioritize. Uh paid prioritization in certain cases might be non-discriminatory. Uh, particularly in cases of zero rating, which by the way, was allowed under the current internet guidelines, but with a potential review. The only difference for zero rating is there won't be any review. Uh, zero rating is just free and open. Zero rating is not discriminating, right? But it can be argued to be a sort of prioritization because you're saying, well, if we have a data cap, we don't count that service over there. And if you're making them pay for that, that's arguably a paid prioritization. So reading the tea leaves, I kind of feel like that's what Comcast talking about. I mean, do you guys feel like that's Comcast saying they're going to violate net neutrality and go hog wild? No, listen, th listen, they are getting slaughtered in a PR war, and I'm not here to say that they shouldn't be slaughtered in a PR war, but they are trying to fight back on it, to be totally honest. I mean, this is not a legal thing, right? This is a publicly stated pledge. They're not in a court of law. They're not you know, being ordered by the government to not do it. And then, then the, the agreement that they've made with some other uh, law enforcement body has been changed. I, I don't trust it because I don't particularly trust Comcast. I didn't trust it the first time. I don't really trust it now. You know, if if they wanted to say, well, yeah, well, you want to know what? We got to keep the lights on here at old Comcast small business headquarters. So we're going to have to offer uh, fast lanes. They do it and, and they would have no uh, moral compunction about it. This is them at least gamely trying to fight what is gigantic and well-deserved public opinion that they are a company that does not have users rights at heart i think oh i think you just you just nailed it justin it doesn't matter what they say on their web page it just doesn't no. it can make you feel justified or angry or happy but it doesn't matter what matters is what does comcast actually do and having written anything on their page for years is not going to matter if they never do any of these things, it's also not going to matter if they do. You're not going to be able to take them to court and say, but they said they wouldn't do this because this is not a legally binding. This is not in their terms of service. Oh, yeah, I, I sure it'll, it'll, it'll get tried in court right after everybody is, who sues Google for being evil. I mean, maybe you could get them to, in front of the FTC for, you know, say, oh, they said they were going to do this and they didn't. Uh, you know, so it, it does set a few very fuzzy boundaries, but this isn't your best way to go about them. It's it's going to be more about consumer harm. And to me, that issue comes down to competition. Uh, and that's the last mile problem. Uh, you will hear Comcast and others really try to make the Netflix battles sound like they are part of net neutrality, to make the peering battles sound like they are part of net neutrality. They are not. That is a separate issue. What net neutrality and what these open internet guidelines uh, pertain to particularly is whether they can charge people to reach their customers. And if they are the only ones who offer service, they have all the customers, which is the only way a, an ISP can get enough leverage to even make an, a Netflix or appearing uh, agreement be debatable. And that's because they have no competition. Uh, I, I feel like if Chairman Pai really wanted to return, as he has said, to a market-based approach, he wouldn't be changing categorizations from telecommunications back to information services, he would be trying to do something to foster competition among ISPs, which he is not doing. Neither did Tom Wheeler. Nobody's addressing the actual problem here. According to the FCC's own last internet access service report from April of this year, 42% of developed areas in America had two ISPs or fewer that offered 25 megabits per second or faster broadband speeds. 21% had none, had That's none of horrific. those. So, a, oh my yeah. God, you guys, this supposed to be an advanced country. That is astonishing. Half the country really can't choose because, and, and even when you have two to choose from, that often settles into a very comfortable duopoly. 
Uh, what you need is what you have in Austin, Texas. Hey, yeah, I got an argument with my friend Brian Brushwood one time. He's like, what are you talking about? We got lots of choice. I'm like, you have lots of choice because Google came into your market and forced people to up their speeds. And yeah, now you've got four providers. And when you got four providers, people can't get sloppy. They can't come in with abusive practices that push people up to the edge, but not quite over because they have nowhere else to go. Uh, yeah, uh, look, we need competition. And and that that brief beautiful moment when when Google was just charging into major markets and and uh, uh, offering insanely competitive and uh, uh, crazy speeds uh, for at, at a reasonable price for consumers at tremendous expense so much so that they had to knock it off and stop doing it uh, it was amazing because it really showed how fast everybody could get up to speed if there was actual true competition to me, and and uh, yeah, it's always it tends to be a, a reductive argument that nobody really wants to hear. But uh, the anti-competitive nature of these companies and how far in bed they have gotten with local governments to prevent competition, to me, has led to the shameful state of the internet in this country. There is no reason why, uh, you know, I, I'm I'm literally. Minutes away, walking distance from some of the biggest technology companies that are reshaping every element of our society. And every two months, I check to see whether or not I can get another ISP other than Comcast that can shoulder the load reliably for me to live stream and podcast and upload. This is not heavy work. I'm not mining uh, a Bitcoin, right? Like I'm not doing anything that I need uh, a, a tremendous throughput for. And yet, every time there is nothing except now oh. apparently i just did it while we were talking at t fiber might be in my neighborhood so go ahead tom i'm going to see if i can uh, get rid of oh, you're back you're up to two well, that's great uh, uh, right. the, 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 there's two ways consumers cannot get you know screwed over either you have healthy competition or you have strict regulation you can't have neither because then you're going to have a disaster and that's oh, we have to strict regulation, by the way, Bart. Our strict regulation in the U.S. is no one else can use the poles. Uh, we're, we'll make <laughs> it very difficult to dig up the streets to lay new fiber. We're going to regulate the hell out of starting an ISP, but we're going to ease the regulations for the existing people. Yeah, I mean, you've got the worst of both worlds there, haven't you? Like, you, you, the theory here is you're heading for a, a free market system, except the market is there is no market. So you're you're setting your regulation on the assumption there's a free market that doesn't exist. So that seems like a failure before it starts. Yeah, it's it's not a free market. It's an existing market where the existing people are free to do whatever they want, but no one else can get in there and change it. Yeah. And don't forget that, uh, you know, uh, municipal broadband uh, is constantly uh, trying to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, taken out uh, through lobbying as well. Well, and there's, yeah, there's another option, right, is maybe the city comes together. The citizens decide, you know what, we consider this a utility. We're going to roll our own. And then the state comes in, in some cases, and says, no, you can't. You cannot, as the citizenry, go into competition with private companies, even though no one else can afford to go into competition with the private companies either. But um, that's an anathema to a free market system. I mean, a cooperative should be able to, to compete with a corporate entity. I mean, what? That's nonsense. Yeah, uh, it's, it's and, and this is my problem. My problem is not with information service versus telecommunication services. These, these definitions are old, they don't apply. And I'll be honest, I don't think these change in regulations are going to change that much because what really keeps these ISPs in check is public opinion uh, and and market groups and 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 consumer rights organizations that put pressure on. It's easier for those groups to do their job now the way the right guidelines are written than it will be uh, after the December fourteenth vote happens and those guidelines are put into place. But it won't ruin the internet. Uh, it won't, it won't help the internet either. This is not doing, you know, you see Ajit Pai saying like, ah, the internet was fine before these guidelines came into place and it'll be fine now. Well, okay, but it's still broken. Like the, the market is broken and it limps along just good enough. And if we're good enough being, you know, in the middle of the pack, as far as internet service goes in the world, then I guess that's fine. Uh, but if we wanted to be better, if we wanted to be up at the top, if we want to be like South Korea, uh, if we want to be like Japan as far as internet service, then we would need to do better. What Ajit Pai is saying to me, my interpretation is, you know, we don't really want to be better. We just want to keep things as they are. 
they're good enough trundling along with 25 megabit per second or less. Because here's another stat, 100 megabits per second. That's something where you don't need to worry about anything. Uh, you'll have all the bandwidth you need at the current moment, right? You can do all the uploading that Justin's talking about. You can handle your Internet of Things devices. You're fine. Uh, there's gigabit fiber going in in lots of places. So this 100 megabits should be the minimum. L less than 3% of the country has access to more than th to three or more providers of 100 megabit per second internet. 51% of the country, half of the United States, has no providers that give you 100 megabit per second. By That's way, the problem. Alarm. False alarm. No AT&T fiber in my building. Uh, I'm sorry to hear that. When you say yeah. false alarm, you mean false dawn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it just, it, it's, it's, it's one of the most shameful things about an otherwise technologically uh, ad ad advanced country is that the, the lack of competition. And, and again, look, there are elements of, of, of what, of what uh, 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 Ajit Pai says that I'm, I am encouraged by as sacrilege as that might be uh, here on the free and open internet. Uh, uh, because I do think, look again, look at what happened in all those markets that Google came crashing in on. Everybody got their act together almost immediately. Time Warner, AT&T, Comcast, all the people that we understand to be bad actors. Uh, all of us like, Oh wow. It, it turns out it's really easy to offer fiber and, and, and you know, the super high speed DSL. Oh man, it's crazy. Wow. It turns out oh, we just, for, we didn't get that far in the book. Oops. Uh, now we will. So it is possible, but uh, uh, to me, it is a tale of corruption and graft that we don't. We don't have it. And, and be it on federal, state, and local level, uh, uh, it is an absolute national shame. Well, who knows? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Ajit Pai's secret plan was, I'll throw this bone to the incumbents and then use that as leverage to get them to stop resisting uh, competitors coming into the market, right? If I'm going to put a happy happy face on that, that's that's what could happen to to make my anger uh, not justified. I, I don't think that's going to happen. It's you know, if you, if you want my depressing prediction for 2018, uh, it's... You know, this to me, this this Comcast change, again, while not, you know, enforceable, actionable, really, in any meaningful way, one way or the other, um, you know, definitely, I mean, it's certainly a trial balloon. And net neutrality is one of those concepts where, you know, at first it was, you know, it's a very simple thing. So people share around that slide of like, you know, oh, your social network's $5 a month and, you know, uh, you know, uh, YouTube and stuff like that, $5 a month. But it's going to get to a point where we're going to be talking increasingly more about technical problems uh, with net neutrality. And I, I think that the danger there is losing consumer interest. All right, folks, if you want to know more about this, go to our Patreon, patreon.com slash DTNS. Anybody at the associate producer level and up uh, gets my monthly column and I have more to say about net neutrality and that laying out some of the arguments we talked about today. Uh, let's thank our panelists, starting with you, Bart Bouchots. Thank you so much for joining us. Where can people find more of what you do? Hey, you can find me at bartb.ie and my podcasts at lets-talk.ie. And Rich Straffolino, what about you? Yeah, you can find me and uh, my writing at Gestalt IT, gestaltit.com. We have all sorts of cool stuff there. We have podcasts, the on-premise IT roundtable going up every other Tuesday. We do a live uh, news rundown. It's called the Gestalt IT Rundown, creatively enough, uh, which I do with another Tom, Tom Hollingsworth, a.k.a. the networking nerd. And we do that every Wednesday live at 12.30 p.m. Eastern on YouTube. And then we have an interview series called IT Origins that I put together where we interview uh, the most interesting people in IT and find out how they got started, what their first computer was, how they stay productive, all that good stuff. And you can follow me on Twitter as well, at Mr. Anthropology, MR Anthropology. Justin Robert Young, what are you up to these days? You can find me angrily looking at this AT&T fiber map until uh, it magically tells me that my apartment will have it. Uh, uh, you can also find me on Twitter, uh, Justin R. Young. If you like some of the politics talk, you can follow me at my political podcast, politics, politics, politics. Well, Sarah, this was fun. Wouldn't it be great I if we did so. this like a couple of times a month? I'd love to, but Tom, how would that be possible? Well, our next milestone at patreon.com slash DTNS is if we get just $2,000 more. Just one of you has to give $2,000 a month. Or, you know, you could split it up. Uh, we will do 
two roundtable episodes a month, just like this one. So join in on the fun. Up your pledge. Get some cool perks like extended shows, exclusive columns, and more at patreon.com slash DTNS. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We are live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2130 UTC at alphageekradio.com and diamondclub.tv. And our website, of course, is dailytechnewsshow.com. Back tomorrow with Jason Howell. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> wow, that was a packed roundtable, but it was great. Thank you, guys. Wonderful show, everybody. Yeah. I think we That's solved right. everything. We Pretty did. much. Oh, yeah, the world is fixed now. Totally oh. done. We nailed Sorry. it. Everybody's talking about it. No need to thank us, world. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm There's one thing I do wish we had gotten in there, but those slides are the greatest pack of lies. Those slides are all advertising zero rating in Portuguese. They're not advertising access to the bloody sites. <laughs> Urgh, it makes me so angry. No, but people shared it on Instagram. So it must be true. Yeah. So it must be exactly what they meant. But again, I mean, to me, that that gets down to, you know, again, we're, we're getting into more technical and technical discussions about net neutrality. I mean, right now, like, you know, it, it's very easy to say, like, hey, don't touch my Internet uh, when you're talking about like peering agreements and, uh, you know, uh, Netflix putting stuff in ISPs, data centers and stuff like that. Like right now we can get people to care. I just I'm very cynical. Uh, that, uh, you know, public interest will be able to be sustained. Although, you know, it's been for, you know, 10 plus years or whatnot. So, yeah, yeah. I could be wrong. Maybe you know, we're as soon, as, as, soon as anybody blocks something and a paid prioritization actually happens, we'll we'll see a SOPA, PIPA type reaction, I guarantee. Oh, my God, everyone will uh, it just, it'll be a poop show. Yeah. Everyone will poop and, <laughs> and they'll show it to everybody. Like, it'll be ridiculous. By the way, hey, you want to know what these uh, uh, SOBs at AT&T did? They literally wired up one building in Oakland. <laughs> they don't like even have a coverage time. map. Like, oh, it's available for you in this region. If you go into their fiber network locator, it shows you building by building where they've uh, wired up their fiber. And there is one building in Chinatown that has AT&T fiber. Is it a residential building? I was at the AT and T oh, building. Oh, Roger, you're, you're gonna have to disconnect and come back. You're all, you're all garbled. Oh my gosh, robot! It's about uh, one, two, three, four, five okay. blocks from the Lake Merritt Bart Station. It's uh, a. <laughs> is it my house? My old house? <laughs> Not. I bet you it's the AT and T no. building. Am I still garbledy? No, no you're, you're good. You're good. Uh, it's, it's at the other side of the lake. Uh, uh, uh by. Of uh, Chinatown, it's it's so and these uh, dirty. Well, you know what AT and T gets to do now is they get to count Oakland as a city where they have laid. We've laid out hundreds of cities. I'm like, oh, fiber available, and so you just literally go there. They get you in the door with fiber, and then they're like, oh, you're an AT and T wireless subscriber. Well, guess what? Would you like to buy dog ass uh, uh, <laughs> from us? Uh, Dude, no, I wouldn't. I came here for I, fiber. Well, would I you like me to rain on your parade even more? Um, Justin, because what? I just found out I actually do get fiber to my house for me. What? They did not offer this last year when I moved down. It was not available. Are you I'm getting available like, now. As soon as we're done, and I'm just like, hey, is there like a petition? Like, is there like a a, a, a process I can go through? Like, do I have to get like 15 signatures from my uh, people that we all agree that we're gonna switch to fiber? Like. Justin, if you want to move to lovely Cleveland, uh, we have uh, all sorts of AT&T fiber rolled out to your residential area of choice. Uh, uh, Rich, meet Lil Song. I will do anything for love, <laughs> but I won't. I'll make it feel slightly better, Justin. I um, A couple of years ago, I was waiting and waiting for uh, cable internet to become available. I had a lot of DSL choices, but no cable. Yeah, I've been wanting a particular company to come in because they are the best. And they paid someone to ring my doorbell and offer to sell it to me, only then to discover it wasn't available. After they rang my doorbell to sell it to me. Yeah, and look, it's not like I have bad internet now. It's like I'm doing a speed test, and we're at 
you know, anywhere between 70 and 100. You were a little garbled That's in your funny. last statement, probably. Well, I'm, I'm running a speed yeah. test now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's funny. So it, it, it's 62 down and... 62 plus the Skype call, so it's probably quite a bit more than 62. Yeah, plus yeah, plus that. So I mean, look, and and 10 up, whatever. It's just it's just such, it's it's such garbage. It's just it's just the the worst. And and these these companies, you know, they they want them. Like that's why everybody's taken seriously. Like it's like it's uh, Comcast putting their hand on the Bible and saying, "Oh, we, we swear we won't do." It's like who cares what they say? Who cares? It's sort of like you know, like when beer companies like run like Happy Holidays. For oh my months. God, this is great! Please be responsible. And you're like, I, you're a Budweiser. I can get you know? a gigabit for eighty bucks a month. That's what I got, Roger. It's that's, great. That's the AT and T fiber deal, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, see, that's what I think I got lured in. I don't okay, know I this is it. here's the best part. <laughs> here's the best part for me. I can't get that. I'm in a neighborhood that's had fiber for a long time, but because Verizon sold the fiber to Frontier, uh, they don't even offer that a gigabit fiber yet, even though they've got fiber. <laughs> I was trying to sort of to try make I was sort of tempted to make us feel bad by counting the amount of possible ISPs I have to choose from here in Ireland, but I honestly lost count after I got to above ten, so I figured <laughs> I, I wouldn't waste my time. Uh, I've, yes. Why am I not you moved know, to Ireland? It has everything I love, including fast internet. And cuts off the two cables that connects the eye. Yeah, the internet. <laughs> no, actually, we have really good interconnectivity because we're basically Europe, Silicon Valley here. I mean, oh, the American companies are all here because we speak English, are in the euro, and are not idiots brexiting. <laughs> oh yeah, we have good tax. That's oh good. yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, and all the money is is there. All, all the yeah, money, it, it's uh, upstairs in an attic in uh, some pub in Dublin. The best. Well, it's not quite as bad as Jersey or Guernsey. Or those guys. So, yeah, yeah. Six all right, guys. Sarah, I have to go. All right. Thank you, Rich. Bye, Rich. Thank you. Bye, Bye Rich. Rich. Fun. Thank you for having me on. Great job. Man, I'm going to look into this. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> still on my 30, I'm still on my $35 a month. This, that's it. We're, we're, if we're not moving to Ireland, we're moving to, Gl to the Burbank Glendale area. As a matter of interest, I, I'm paying 50 euros a month for my for my internet which i think is 100 megabits i'm wondering what sort of prices people are paying in the well, states that's 300 comparable megabit. to what i pay 300 mm -hmm. megabit per second fiber from frontier cost 300 dollars a month <laughs> i pay time warner spectrum now uh i think it's 60 bucks a month just for internet service i don't have any cable stuff uh bundled in which is like i don't know compared to a internet cable bundle that I've done in the past seems really cheap, but that's my only choice. Yeah. That's literally the only company I could sign up with when I moved into this house. I, I have, so I'm in this strange situation where I ha I'm paying for phone and internet because it's cheaper than just internet. Which is also like, what? Like, yeah. That's backwards world. I just, so I don't, I, want, I don't plug the phone in, but I have it technically. Anyway, sorry, sorry, Roger. No, no, there's a really good company out here called Giggle Fiber, and it's an independent fiber company, but they're in a very they're very restricted location, like out by Arcadia and stuff, but you can get like 500 megabits for like 60 bucks a month. That's pretty sweet. Oh, hey, Roger, uh, we didn't have Len listed. Is he in tomorrow or out? Uh, he, oh, he should be in. We just oh, had Jason yes. down there. Oh, you know, let me see, let me see. And how much? I think, no, is, I think I is Len. Um, okay, I mean, I feel like he's in. I feel like he's. I, I, he I the back. reason why I'm questioning is because I remember he he uh, pinged me about this. And you have I, him on the calendar he, still, huh? You have him on the calendar still. Uh, hmm. All right. You know, I might be mixing up months. Uh, all right, holidays are hard. Be. We have right. a lot of stuff going on at weird times. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm gonna go. I'm out of here too. You rep. I love Thanks you. Thanks everybody. Bye. Good Thanks night, everybody. Or good afternoon or good morning.